Good morning. I have looked forward to this, and yet I'll say with a little bit of trepidation, and I'll explain why. Uh, it's not uh, my regular habit in gospel meetings to, uh, to deal with the topic of the Holy Spirit, but I always uh, try to deal with whatever is most needful at a place, and uh, that's, that's what was brought up. I personally think this is a study that can help all of us to be stronger in our faith. It has that ability. But we're going to have to study together as we go through. You may notice on occasion I'll use a verse that I've used in a previous lesson. That's because I'm going to be demonstrating different elements and pulling all that together. And some verses will tell you more than one thing if you think about it. So that's the way that we'll be looking at it as we go along. The Holy Spirit is, after all, a divine person. You might say, why do you bother to tell us that? We already knew that. Well, because there are those who deny that the Holy Spirit is a person. We're going to affirm that the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, in one of their little booklets called Reasoning from the Scriptures, on page 381 says this, it is logical to conclude that the Holy Spirit is the active force of God. It is not a person, <clears throat> but it is a powerful force that God causes to emanate from himself to accomplish his holy will. Now, before I go any further, I want to offer a suggestion to all of us in reference to people who may come to the door and want to talk to us about Scripture, please do not engage them by trying to show them their error. And that sounds funny, doesn't it? How are we going to, what are we going to do then? Well, we're, going to, we're going to let questions lead them to their own understanding of truth. If you'll ask questions, you can cause them to have to think. Too many times, the people that come to the door, and sometimes this includes even some of us, as we go door knocking, we have a set routine, and we follow that routine almost without thought. Well, that's what happens with these individuals that I'm talking about now. They've never really thought through the position that they're taking, nor have they thought through the scripture uh, that, that they may be using. They will pull it out of context and cause it to say things it does not say. So our goal this morning as we begin is to demonstrate the Holy Spirit is not just a force. The Holy Spirit is a person. How do we know that? Because the Spirit speaks. In John chapter 16, verse 13, we find Jesus saying, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, uh, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now, for just a moment, let me ask you a question. Is electricity a force? And I would answer that, yes, it's a force. Has it ever spoken to you? I mean, other than blowing you across the room when you touch the wrong thing with a, with, with a, with a piece of metal, other than that, it's not spoken to you, has it? It's never, never delivered words. It may have delivered a message of sorts, but, but not words. It doesn't speak, but the Spirit does speak. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. So the Spirit speaks. But furthermore, the Spirit knows and the Spirit reveals. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Here's the Apostle Paul explaining to the brethren in, at Corinth how it was that he was able to deliver the truth. And here's what he says, beginning in verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. 
So the Spirit reveals. Now, let's see if we can understand that in terms of, of us here today. I may walk up to someone, or you may walk up to me, and the question normally, first question is, how are you doing today? And I've had many people at, from time to time that answered that this way. Well, it's not going to do any good to tell you. Nobody really cares. And my response to that is to say, well, I care. That's why I asked. So would you let me know how you are? Well, see, until they reveal it to me, I can't know. If they don't let me hear their heart, what's in their heart, I'll never know. It may be an emotional issue. It may be, it, it may be a physical issue. We don't know until they reveal it to us. Well, similarly, we don't know what God thinks until the Spirit of God reveals to us the will of God. And that's what the Apostle Paul said that the Spirit does. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is describing his own ministry. And as he does so, here's what he says in verse 5. Well, let's just pick up verse 1 to get a good context. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that, by revelation, he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Okay, first of all, we need to understand the word mystery. What's a mystery? A mystery is something that is covered. Okay, so you don't know what's there because it's covered. All right, now, I'm going to guess. I don't know who it is. I'm not thinking of anybody here, so don't think I am. But I'm going to guess that you've got at least one really good prankster in this congregation. Okay, so let's imagine that this prankster is a man. That's not always true, but we're going to imagine that it is. And let's imagine that I've been invited to go camping in, in a, some cabins with, with this man and others. And uh, <clears throat> we get into the cabin that night, and all the cots or the, the bunks are all made up. Everything's ready to go. And they say, you, the prankster says, you'll be sleeping right there. And I look over there, and underneath the covers, there's something that is coiled up. Am I going to let them turn the lights out before I pull the covers back? Well, you don't know me very well if you answered yes. <laughs> I'm going to insist that we pull the covers. Now, it may just be that he got a piece of rope and coiled it up just to have fun with me. It may be that he got a rubber snake. That within itself might do me in. But it may be that he found uh, just a simple, you know, a, a king snake or something that really wouldn't hurt me, but he'd put it under there. I want to know what it is. But it's a mystery until you pull the covers back. All right. In the Old Testament, what we need to understand is that God's plan to save Jew and Gentile in one body, the church, was a mystery. It's a mystery that people wanted to know about, but it was not revealed to them. The Apostle Paul comes along and he says the Holy Spirit has now revealed it. He's made it known. That requires, uh, on his part, an ability, a, a person-like ability that we are talking about. So we discover that the Spirit both knows and reveals. But then furthermore, the Spirit takes action. Let's look at some of his actions. Uh, John chapter 14 and verse 26, we find Jesus saying, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Two actions there. One is teach, which goes along a little bit with the the earlier one about speaking, 
But then the other is he's going to bring to your remembrance. He's going to cause you to think about things in the past that have gone on. Later in our study together, we'll actually look at two passages in the book of John where John uses the words, after he was raised, we remembered. Well, how did they remember? Well, Jesus says how they remembered. The Holy Spirit did it. It was an action he partook in. Then we have Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Here is Paul along with Silas. They're traveling along. Paul's wanting to go into new territory. That's pretty common for Paul, if you know anything at all about him. But here's the record that Luke gives us. Now, when they'd gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Again, forbidden. You, a force doesn't forbid. A force does not, does not act in human ways or in, in the ways of a person. But here's the Spirit forbidding. Clearly, he is a person. And then finally, the Spirit displays emotion. Look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 30. We're just going to look at the opening part of that verse where he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You can't grieve a force. Uh, when a tornado strikes a town, the tornado does not feel bad and, and feel grief for all the people that were hurt. In the midst of the tornado, it's a force, no doubt about that. But it has no feeling at all. Only persons have feelings. Now look at Romans chapter 15, verse 30. The Apostle Paul is hoping uh, to come to, uh, to Rome. He's hoping to get an opportunity to be uh, with those Roman Christians at some point in the future. And as he writes to them, he wants them to help him with something. Listen to what he has to say in verse 30 of Romans 15. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Please notice the love of the Spirit. Again, a force doesn't display love. A force is just a force. But persons, individuals, display love, and the Spirit displays love. Now, if you don't mind a side note, could I pick up one word there? Strive together is, is uh, uh, soon agonizomai. And soon just means with. And agonizomai, you know, you can almost hear it, can't you? Agony. He's saying, join me in agonized prayer until I get to come be with you. That's the point. Uh, but he does it, makes that plea on the basis of the love of the Spirit. And that's the, that is the key that we want to pick up on here. So the Holy Spirit, we have clearly seen, is, after all, a person. But then beyond that, the Holy Spirit is God. I said he's a divine person, so we're going to have to contend that he is God. In the book of Acts, chapter 5, we find an incident that helps us to see that the Holy Spirit is God. You remember this story, don't you? This is the story of two people, Ananias and Sapphira. Now, you may remember at the end of chapter 4 that we learned that people, especially including a fellow by the name of Barnabas, son of consolation, uh, son of encouragement, that people have been selling property that they have and giving the money, laying it at the apostles' feet so that they can distribute that money to help take care of the needs of various saints. You know, take a widow, for example. A widow new to the city of Jerusalem, and many of them were in Acts chapter 2, uh, that widow would have no means of support. She had no means to even put bread on her table. And so she needed the bread to be, t to be given to her. Uh, during that particular time. So men like Barnabas sold property and gave the money to the apostles. Well, apparently, and I said apparently, I can't prove this, but it, it looks like Ananias and Sapphira liked all the praise, but they didn't want to give all the money. Just putting it simply. They had a piece of property, 
And so they sold that piece of property for a certain sum of money. And they decided to give only a part of it, but to pretend, apparently, again, from the text, to pretend that it was all the money. And so listen to what happens. We'll just pick up at verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? I don't know if you <clears throat> underline in your Bible. Uh, I, I, actually, I've gone beyond uh, underlining for the most part. Uh, I, I now have bought a box of colored pencils. And why have I done that? Well, because I found out if you take a, a, a highlighter and you highlight on Acts chapter 5, that that highlight goes all the way down to Acts chapter 10. goes straight through the pages. So that, that is not going to work. And then when I, when I underline with a pen, well, sometimes I accidentally smeared it as my hand went across the top, you know, lots of things like that. So I here's what I found out. If you get a green, and I'm just choosing one, choose any color you like, green colored pencil, and just lightly rub it over the word or words that you want to highlight, well, you can still read the words, but now it's green. And then, so in this verse, if I were doing that, and by the way, I have done something like that in my Bible, I, I highlighted lie to the Holy Spirit. Now watch the next verse. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And so in that verse, I <clears throat> highlighted lied and then to God. So is the Holy Spirit God? Well, apparently Peter thought he was. Because Peter said, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, and then he said, you've lied to God. So it's very important for us to see he is then truly God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, the writer of those early Hebrew Christians tells them, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. <clears throat> One characteristic of God is that he is eternal. Uh, no, no other individual or no other thing can be described as eternal. You want to know the biggest problem that people who support the concept of evolution have? They basically have to make matter be eternal. And it's not. It won't work that way, and it creates real problems for them. Only God is eternal. So if we find a, an individual, a person, as we have described and found the Holy Spirit to be, who is eternal, then we can conclude he is God. Now look again. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13, the prophet Isaiah asks an interesting question. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or who, or, or, or as his counselor, has taught him? <clears throat> now, obviously, these two questions are rhetorical. And that is, they, they basically answer themselves. So who is it that directed the Spirit of God? We could all answer together, couldn't we? No one. Or who has taught him? And again, we could all answer together, couldn't we? No one. Why not? Because, as these questions indicate, the Holy Spirit is omniscient. Now, somebody says, there you go, using those big words. Well, my parents paid a lot of money for me to learn that big word. And so, but I'll boil it down for all of us so that we understand it. Omniscient just means all-knowing. That's all it means, all-knowing. You can't teach the Spirit anything because he's all-knowing. That's the reason. 
He is God. But then look at another place. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalms chapter 139, verse 7. Probably David writes this. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? That indicates then that the spirit is omnipresent. And again, all that means is he's everywhere. The spirit is everywhere. God is everywhere. And so is the spirit God? And the answer to that question from these passages clearly would be yes. He's eternal. He is all-knowing. He is all present everywhere. All of these things indicate to us that the Spirit is God. But then furthermore, the works of the Spirit declare his deity. In the book of Job, chapter 26, verses 13 and 14, we find Job writing this. By his spirit, he adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways. And how shall small a whisper we hear of him? But the thunder of his power, who can understand? The spirit adorned things in the creation. What's the, was the spirit present? at the creation. We know Jesus was. John makes that very clear in the book of John, doesn't he? John chapter 1, uh, beginning of verse 1, when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that, that was made. So Jesus was the creator. And by the way, could Jesus be created? That same group that we talked about in the beginning says he was created. But I want you to observe that John, by inspiration, says, without him was not anything made that was made. So if he was created, he created himself. And that's kind of a, uh, that's mind-boggling. <laughs> Just to even consider that, that's not possible. That's not true. It's not what happened. So Jesus was in the beginning. He was the creator. What role did the spirit play? Well, apparently he played a twofold role. Job says he adorned the creation. Uh, you might say, what in the world is adorning the creation? And all of us men are just uh, uh, awestruck by the very idea. What does it mean? The women would have a little better chance to understand this. Who adorns your house? Well, at our house, my wife does. Uh, she puts paintings on the wall, and believe me, she knows exactly where she wants them to be. Uh, she puts, uh, you know, certain things on the on the coffee table, uh, on display, and again, she knows exactly where she wants them to be. If I dare to move something, I can assure you, it will be moved back. It will it will go back to where it already. She adorns the house. So the Spirit adorned the creation. How did he do that? You know, I don't know. And that is a perfectly good answer. It's an answer we need to learn to give, brethren. Do not try to answer something that you do not know the answer to. It, in the end, it will create nothing but problems for you and possibly for the person who has asked you the question. Problems for you because you may learn you were wrong in your supposition. Problems for them because they may never learn you were wrong in your supposition. And so don't, don't assert things you don't know. How did he adorn the creation? I don't know. I have no idea. I cannot tell you how he did. But I can tell you something else he did at the creation. In Genesis chapter 1, it is interesting to note that the word that is used for God in that chapter consistently, some 30, maybe 32 times, if you go through verse 2 of chapter 2, uh, the word that is used for God is Elohim, which is the plurality of power. Be very careful not to say that the word God in Genesis 1 is plural, and therefore we know there's more than one being in God. That's not really a good argument. The Elohim is the plurality of power. And so he is the most powerful God. That's the, that is really the key 
in that chapter. But I want us to particularly now pick up on verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, where it says, this, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God, uh, the word in the original is Ruach Elohim, and it just means the Spirit of God, just exactly as it is translated. And so, is he God? Yes, he's a specific part of what it means to be God. Now, I suspect that there are folks in here who are like me in days gone by who are thinking this is all very confusing. There's one God, but there are three persons who make up God. And I don't understand that. I don't see anything in this world that's like that. Well, maybe you need to look again. A few years ago, I had a, a teacher of little children. I'm talking about the preschool children. The, you know, that was her specialty. And she explained to me how she tells children about the three in one who make God. And here's what she said. Have you ever thought about an egg? An egg has a shell, it has a yolk, and it has a white. But how many eggs are there? Well, it's just one. So God has the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And yet they are just one. One God. I thought that was a pretty good illustration. And as old as I was at the time, and as many times I'd talked about God and the three that make up that one God, I learned something. And now I'm sharing it with you. So if you want, this gives me another lesson on the side. If you really want to know anything, go to a preschool teacher. They can teach you. <laughs> Probably because they've been taught by the children all those years. If and our children are brilliant. They do teach, but they usually teach through questions, don't they? The very thing we started off with this morning as we began this study. So the Spirit was in creation. He was adorning. He was there hovering over the face of the water. How, what did he do to adorn? I don't know. Uh, but I can tell you something else he did do. And that is that he, by hovering over the face of the waters, he was able to reveal to Moses everything that happened. And so uh, sometimes I'll say regarding the Father that he's the divine planner. The Son is the divine mover, or he takes actions based on the plan. And the Spirit is the divine reporter. Now, I grant you they play other roles. And I don't, don't, don't lock them in like that. I'm not trying to. But in general... You can say that about them. The works of the Spirit then prove that he is God, don't they? That he is deity. In Job chapter 33, verse 4, we find the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Well, in what sense? Well, again, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. But I know he, he plays a role in giving me life. So maybe the, all three members of the Godhead had a direct action involved in creation. Apparently they do, but how does it work out? Well, I don't know. Uh, years ago, when we lived in Cahokia, Illinois, my dad was a preacher there, my best friend, and this is going to sound really funny, but my best friend at that congregation was 104 years old. And I know that because I have a painting that my mother saved that that 104-year-old man had, had done and had given for, to me to be preserved. My mother didn't throw anything away, so I got it. <laughs> I got that painting. But his name then, to me, was Mr. Wilson. And Mr. Wilson found out that I was a, like a two-year-old. I wasn't two, but I asked lots of questions. By the way, I'm still that way. So if you talk to me while I'm here, I'm liable to ask you all kinds of questions. You have every right to say, that's none of your business. That's perfectly fine, but I'm going to ask questions. It's just the way I do. Well, I watched and listened to Mr. Wilson, and finally I said to him one day, I said, Mr. Wilson, what's that list that you keep talking about? And he said, Gary, does your mom have one of those plastic things that, that you put 
uh, adding machine tape in and, you, and it has some magnets and you stick it on the refrigerator door and you write down things that you need to buy at the grocery store. I said, oh yeah, we've got one of those. It's hanging on our refrigerator door, just like you said. He said, well, I've got one of those too, but I don't put my grocery list on it. He said, instead, every time I have a question to which I do not know the answer, I write it down on my list so that when I get to heaven, I can ask. And so, brethren, I've got a suggestion for you. When you don't understand something, write it down. Put it on your list. And maybe the Lord will reveal it to us in heaven. Maybe it won't matter anymore. I don't know. But that's, that's what I think about this particular verse. Then in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, we find, And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You can go either way with this. It, the Spirit may have played a direct role in the resurrection. I am suspicious that that's true. But if it's not true, then here's what I do know. He played a direct role in revealing the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And in either case, he's involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the works of the Spirit declare his deity. And then the Holy Spirit works with the Father and the Son. Look at Matthew chapter 3, if you would. You may remember what's going on here. Uh, John is uh, in the Jordan or at the Jordan baptizing people. And Jesus comes to him, verse 13 of Matthew 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Please, I used the dove imagery all through this series, but the dove Im imagery is just to remind us he descended like a dove. And if you've ever seen a dove land, then you know approximately how that took place. Was the spirit a dove? No, he was not a dove. He descended like a dove. So what do we have here? We've got Jesus coming up out of the water, having been baptized. We've got the spirit descending like a dove. And then verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So now we've got the son, the spirit, and the Father, all in action at the same time. And you might say, why is that important? Because it demonstrates there are three, not just one. Do you know that there are people that teach that Jesus is just one name for the only God? That he is, that in other words, he plays all three roles. He's Father, he's Son, he's Spirit. He's all of those. Well, this verse puts the lie to that. And if, again, if I had somebody telling me that Jesus is, is it all of them, then I would simply turn to this passage and say, could you explain this to me then? I really would like to know. And by the way, that's my new technique in asking people for Bible studies. I ask them, would you be willing for me to come to your house and you teach me what you believe about the salvation? That's what I asked them to do. And, but I always tell them, I'm a two-year-old. I ask a lot of questions because I want to be sure I understand what you're saying. And, you know, I've found that's more effective teaching people than me going in and trying to be the expert. I'm not the expert anyway. I'm just somebody that can help you look at Scripture, help somebody look at Scripture, and hopefully come to a true understanding. That's the goal, at least, that I would have. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, Paul actually describes all three of these persons in action together when he prays this prayer for the Corinthian Christians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit 
be with you all. So there, there he is making a request for all three to be involved in making this group of Christians stronger by being with them. And then we have Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. You'll note that Matthew says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, or the end of the age, whichever way you prefer to translate that. So here is Jesus by his authority, an authority given to him after the resurrection. Very important to see that. Once he's raised from the dead, he has all authority. Now that authority is over the church, universal. And by the way, when will he lay that authority down? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he'll lay it down when the resurrection comes. Now that goes counter to your friends and neighbors who believe in premillennialism. Because they believe when Jesus comes to earth, he's going, first of all, he's going to come all the way to earth again. There's no passage that says that. And secondly, they believe he's then going to assume authority. No, Paul says he's going to give it up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so under the authority they had then, the complete authority in the church, he said, go make that disciples effectively by baptizing them. That's how you make a real disciple of Jesus. You cannot be a student of Jesus Christ without being baptized. And we're going to see that in the next lesson uh, a lot more thoroughly than we are right now. But suffice it to say that's the way you become a student, therefore a disciple, of Jesus Christ. All right. As you baptize them, you're going to baptize them. Now watch this. In the name of. And it's in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. But the, the idea of name of is uh, the authority of. If, and boy, I hope this doesn't happen while I'm here, but if uh, tonight... Uh, at, at the motel room where you all graciously allowed me to stay, there were to come a knock on the door, open up in the name of the law. Well, I would not open the door and expect to find a big book of laws on the floor. I would expect to find a police officer uh, there. And why does he mean in the name of the law? He's coming under the authority of the law. And again, as far as I know, that's not going to happen. I haven't done anything wrong. I didn't even speed going down the hill last night. Of course, I was properly warned, but, but I did not speed. <laughs> I was very, very careful about that. All right, so here the three are. All of them exercise authority in helping one to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's what we've learned. So the Holy Spirit is truly a divine person. He is a person. We saw that because of the things he feels and the things he does. He furthermore is God, and we demonstrated that by demonstrating he has the characteristics of God, being eternal, being uh, everywhere present, having all knowledge. Those demonstrate he's God. The works of the Spirit declare his deity. He's involved in things that only God could have done, and therefore it declares his deity. And finally, that he works along with the Father and the Son. That lays the foundation now for what we're going to do for the remainder of this meeting. Thank you.